Well, hello and welcome to this midweek edition of Xandermonium with me, Xander Gibb. Um, first of all, apologies uh, for us not being able to broadcast on Sunday. We had technical difficulties. Uh, for those of you that don't know, this show is done um, by telephone um, and via the internet. And our call was dropped by the radio station and we couldn't get back in. So we're having that um, interview with Jeff Christian today instead. Um, <clears throat> before we start, I want to um, send my uh, thoughts and condolences out to everyone that's been affected by Hurricane Sandy, uh, which has really devastated the region. Um, and I would um, ask you to keep them in your thoughts and prayers uh, until the whole cleanup is dealt with and done, New York is really not going to be the same. So um, thank you to everybody who has been inquiring about me uh, and my safety. We're all well. We didn't lose power, thank God, although the area is pretty uh, badly affected. I'd like to uh, have a big shout out for all the Grimsby people that are listening. I'd also like to say happy birthday to all of the team at um, Shalom Youth Club, Shalom Youth Center, and John Ellis, 40 years young this year, with over 37,000 members worldwide, one of the biggest and most successful youth projects ever. Um, I really credit John Ellis for this and attempting to keep me on the straight and narrow as a young person and for helping to cu help cultivate my moral fiber. Sir, you are a doyen. Anybody that would like to donate to um, Shalom Youth Center, you can check them out on Facebook or you can contact John Alice on Facebook too. Okay, so let's get to our interview. And if you're live chatting, feel free to uh, ask the questions of Jeff who is in the chat room. Jeff Christian is an international author, TV presenter, singer, composer, and drag queen. His book, Where'd You Put Your Willy, has met overwhelming acclaim, and there are rumors it's going to be made into a movie. I think we'll for find out a bit more about that later. I know a certain fa actor would, that would be perfect for the lead role. Well, I've known Jeff for many years now when we trod the boards together in London's theater land. And a recent Big Brother uh, stint as a segment host has highlighted his entertainment prowess. These things coupled with his music being used in the upcoming movie, movie Spiderlings by Salem Kapsaki, the future looks very right for this quadruple threat. I am proud to call him my sister, but you can call him Jeff Christian. Welcome, Mr. Jeff Christian. Well, Jeff, it's been a long time, my friend. How's it hanging? I'm fine, thank you. How lovely to speak to you. It's <laughs> great to speak to you, too. And how dare you be more famous than me? No, seriously, with all the stuff that I've been hearing about you lately, and it's all good stuff, like uh, a book, a good year so far. Big Brother, movie soundtrack, and a potential movie of the book, which we'll talk about later if you're allowed to talk about it. And I want to know if you're going to be moving to New York City when you're really famous. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I'm too much, I'm, I'm far too English. I think I'd love to come to New York. And, uh, and meet the New York people and work there. I really would love to perform there, but um, I don't imagine myself moving there um, any any time soon. But um, or at least perhaps until they um, start the water out of the subways, maybe. But, but uh, <laughs> yeah, when they pump that water out of the subway, which I think is going to be quite a while, because as you know, we've had uh, a, a hurricane here called Sandy. Um, and and it's really caused a lot of devastation in the area. But you know, thankfully, that not not that, that any loss of life is acceptable. But it's been very minimal. And I don't know. It's it's been very scary, actually. That's good. We've been watching from here. Everybody's been watching. It's been on the news regularly, and um, it, it is frightening to, to see because you just don't know. That's the problem with with the weather. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, generally speaking, in the UK, we're kind of lucky because we don't get the extremes of weather uh, in the weather we do in other parts of the world. But I think what's 
shocking is for us is that we can relate to New York because of London, because of, you know, being from London or living in London, we can relate to it much more than we can other parts of the world. You know, you think there's a drought in India or something, and it's very sad that you don't relate to it in the same way, but when it hits a city like New York, you think, oh my God, that could that could very easily be London. And Absolutely. I think it's Absolutely. And I think, I think the American people see, uh, like New York, uh, people see London as like it's European sister city. Yes, I think you're right. Yes. You know, there's always that yeah, solace and, and between and the two would, places. The way that it would affect London, we can relate to that. We can, you know, we can understand, you know, if the, 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 the um, network of uh, transport is down or if, you know, the stock exchange is closed or we can, we can relate to that. And I think that that's what makes it all the more shocking when you see something. And the thing about it is you, you, there are so many movies where they love to destroy New York in movies, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> some sort of giant, giant lizard or some tornado or something happens. But when it, when it starts to become reality, it gets very scary and very personal as well. It's, it's very upsetting, you know. And the, and the funny thing is, the New York you see in the movies is, is really not the real New York. Like, um, you no. get the impression everyone's got a gun and everyone's going to kill you and rape you and pillage you. And it's really not like that. I mean, it's very much well, like I London. It's the, same with, it's the same with London as well. I mean, there was a film not too long ago uh, of uh, a movie of Thunderbirds, which originally was, a, was an English puppet, puppet series. As you right. Know, yeah, I remember that. And, uh, and they made London look so lovely and bright and shiny and because <laughs> it's not really like that either no. it's um, interesting to see but <laughs> so tell me a bit more about your book I, I, let me read this quote um, I'm not sure where it came from but it says Where'd You Put Your Willy is an effervescent comedy masterpiece of murder betrayal and deceit and gorgeous frogs <laughs> I don't know where that quote came from, but I, I found that, and... Well, it's, um, I, I originally started writing the story about five years ago um, with an intention, the intention for it to be a television series in the UK. Right. Um, I found myself a producer, and then what they wanted to do was to make it into a radio series because as somebody that's uh, writing on this level for the first time generally speaking it's very hard to get into television totally for a lot of many, many people in the business understand um, and so I thought well you know as a, a, a radio show that sounds good uh, it's a good way of developing the script and making it you know more interesting and actually hearing how the characters are going to sound we went through casting I've got a fantastic cast of people um, here um, there was a, a the two main drag queens were played, played by a very good theatre actors um, and uh, one of the other main characters, uh, Madame Fifi, was played um, by um, a lady that uh, is a regular star on The Archers, which is a very famous... Lady, yeah, uh, I've heard of The Archers. Yeah, yeah Sunny on one, she's fantastic. She plays a lady, a character called Lillian Bellamy, who's a bit of a, a sort of a toy boy chaser. <laughs> Sounds a bit like me then, really. <laughs> injected so much life into it and um, so uh, we recorded a pilot um, the radio series didn't get placed although um, there's quite a big station digital station here called Gaydar that wanted to pick up on it right um, but of course then we went into the session so it was difficult to get invested at all um, but the one thing about when it came to writing the book is having heard them uh, in uh, the actors creating the characters within the radio pilot it made it much easier for me to write the book because I could hear their voices Absolutely. which made a big difference to me um, the story itself is um, about a closeted Essex guy that really hasn't had much of a, a life at all um, that suddenly inexplicably gets left a small fortune in shares in a very famous drag nightclub that he's never heard of in central London um, he gets all this left him by a very eccentric drag queen that's just died and um, he doesn't really understand why he's only known this drag queen for you know a few weeks um, and it's very it's inexplicable nobody understands why but a part of the condition of the will in order to receive this money in the shares is that he must become a drag queen himself wow what an amazing plot twist for, for six weeks so really the 
the, the book covers the six week journey that he takes. Wow. But in the meantime, um, because he leaves Essex to go and do this job, the Essex Mafia who have him under the thumb. <laughs> and the Essex the Mafia. Club, he realizes he realizes that there's a bigger secret plan in place and that he actually knows and can relate to the, the club and the people within the club a lot more than he ever dreamed possible. But the scary thing initially that starts him off in the book, which is featured in the radio pilot, is of course he's never been on stage, he's never right. sung, he's you know, he's never dressed in any type of costume, let alone in drag. And as people that work in the drag industry know it's not as easy as it looks. No. Um, it's a very scary event for him. But um, the club is uh, uh, run by uh, a psycho bitch. Um, and they all. Adam Fifi. Yes, he <laughs> has uh, a lot of fingers in lots of pies and lots of wheeling and dealing within this club and, and uh, the surrounding area in Soho in central London. Um, and um, and the two drag queens that are, that are already working there, of course, have to train him and teach him and... and try to relate to him, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. So it's, it's a very roller coaster sort of white knuckle ride story, and it's very off the wall, and there's a lot of new comedy in it, a lot of comedy one-liners, and also um, there are a lot of songs in it, brand new original drag songs. Um, so it's the reaction to the book so far has been great. Um, the people that have bought it that have commented, um, they all seem to like it, which I'm really pleased about because, of course, with anything like that, you don't really know um, until until it's out there. The one thing about performing live on stage, as I do um, more often than not, um, and I have done mostly over the years, is that you get an instant reaction. So if you try something new, a new song, a new costume, a new look or a new idea or a new joke, you have an instant reaction. And they're not sh they're not shy to tell you how they feel, are they? Or show you um, in their life situation exactly how they feel about what you just said or what you just sang or even what you're wearing. Absolutely. Uh, it's instant, good or bad. You know straight away and you know that you can do something about it. With the book, which is a new experience for me, it's very odd because it gradually drifts in over time. So you put it out there. It's like sending, sending one of your children to school and then suddenly you, you, so you don't really know how they're getting on until you get the end of term report. Um, uh, and so it's a bit like that in a way. It's sort of baiting, you know, a lot of nail biting, a lot of sort of how's this going to work, how's that going to work, and are people going to like this, and what are people going to, are they going to understand it, are they going right. to the story, you know, because it is a very, there's lots and lots and lots of twists and turns. And I guess you've had to make it quite mainstream, haven't you, so it appeals to everybody rather than just the gay community, because you don't want it just for yeah. gay people, do you? You want it for everybody to uh, enjoy. <laughs> The main, the main character, the, the protagonist, whose name is Michael, uh, is a closeted gay man who obviously has to kind of quite abruptly be uncloseted right. um, against his will. But with the same token, it's set in a very straight world. So I think that people should be able to relate to it. On, Absolutely. On, 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 I hope so, anyway. And didn't, mm -hmm. and didn't the book come out of your, um, your uh, column in the Pink Wire publication in the UK? Um, did it come out of it? Yeah, wasn't what wasn't it born out of those things that you wrote for that originally? Um, well, in, in, a, in a roundabout way, there's a kind of connection with the Pink Wire column. Is very uh, it, it, the stories there are anecdotes, right? So in other words, the things that have happened to me as a drag queen, uh, whether in drag or out of drag, um, over the years. I think what the pink wire column reflects is that I've always been sort of quite shy and reserved and perhaps what maybe some people would call typically English. Um, but I think that having started working with drag, what it now has done after 20 years in costume has made me look at the world in a slightly different, less cynical, a more light-hearted way. Right. Uh, looking at the world through drag tinted glasses, if you like, the kind of phrase. Absolutely. Um, uh, and I think that's what the, the uh, Adventures of a Drag Queen column in Pink Wire is really about. Where to put you in the book also began autobiographically in the respect that, as you know, they say uh, all the best writers tend to write from the experience. Right. So it does, it does, it, it, it started about me, but as the story's evolved, I think it's become less and less about me. Right. But it is written from the experience that the major key storylines and twists and uh, challenges and traumas are actually things that I've experienced. 
but absolutely it completely separate it's a separate story that it doesn't repeat in the pink wire columns they're completely different stories and events all together so for people that might not know to explain what the title actually means because anyone that's done drag will understand it but maybe a lot of people will not understand exactly what the phrase where do you put your willy means it's, in, it's interesting you say that actually because we we had a, a, a couple of months ago we were contacted by a pr lady in uh, america she was based in la and she was talking about promoting the book through um, north america uh, and perhaps canada and um she she investigated it she read the book um and she said i've decided that i can't actually take this project on and we were quite surprised at the time because it was fairly advanced and we said why and she said well it's the title right put you really we just we just we don't think people are gonna gonna be able to accept that as a title can you think of something else to call it and i said no <laughs> basically right. but the, the, the title comes from um it, it's actually a question that i've been asked more often than anything else whilst in my drag, drag career which is where do you put your willy? Well, willy, of course, is, is a sort of um, a, a very sort of friendly term for um, a male appendage, uh, and of course, he's talking you know, penis, it, people. Exactly. I think it's something that fascinates people is what do you do with it? Where does it disappear? Right. You, know, you can't just sort of you can't just take it off and leave it in the dressing room and stick it back on again when you come back out. Um, so, um, uh, and that um, that of course related quite heavily to the protagonist in the story, Michael, because of course he, he, he's clueless, he doesn't understand any of these things, and it's one of the first questions that he asks, where do you put your willy when you're getting into costume, what do you do, you know, what do you do with it? Um, I won't tell you what the... What the uh, no, no, because um, you want to leave something for people to... But that's what it means, basically. Right. And I don't know whether people will find it offensive, but what I have discovered is that every single time you say the title, it makes people smile, and at the end of it, over the comedy book... You know, I can't right. if, if that's all we, all we ever achieve, so that's quite good for me. <laughs> so just for the American listeners, we're basically talking about tucking, aren't we? Tucking underneath, yes. Yeah. So for, the, for, those who, for those who wish to know, a, a quick education in... in <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe the American title could be Where Do You Tuck Your Todger? When you're wearing a when you wear a, a tight costume you, you can't actually see any the only bulge that you're likely to see is perhaps the Adam's apple. Right. And everything else bulges where it's supposed to. Absolutely. <laughs> so I know your book is available on, on Amazon. Uh where else can people buy it? Well, it's actually um it's printed in the UK and it's also printed in North America so this means that you can go into uh, any good American bookshop and ask for it. Um, I don't know, uh, at the moment I don't know because we haven't had all the figures come through, I don't know where it is stocked and where it isn't stocked, which particular stores or which uh, towns or, or Right, but um, it's available online isn't it? People can buy it online. Go into any, yeah, you can, go, you can buy it online instantly from Amazon um, and, uh, and the US Amazon of course, but you can also go into any bookshop and ask for uh, right. And if they haven't got it, they'll order it for you and should have it with you sort of within a few days. So the title is Where'd You Put Your Willy? And it's by Jeff Christian, and that's with a K. So go out there and buy it. Anyone that doesn't yeah. buy it, I'm going to flirt with your boyfriend, okay? <laughs> it's Jeff with a J and Christian with a K. Jeff, you see the American spelling of Jeff as well, so it should be... Absolutely. Yeah, because in England they say they use um, think, G-O, G-O. Is that Dick Tracy's brother? Is that spelling? Is that Dick Tracy's brother, Jeff Tracy? <laughs> Every time I talk to you, we get, we get mad to the subject of Dick. I don't know what it is about you. I, I don't know what you mean. I, I'm, I'm told I'm not allowed to talk about those kind of things. So, moving swiftly on. So, where is where is Jeffrey Spangle nowadays? Spangle, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinarily young, I um, uh, I just come out of doing theatre at school, and um, me and a group of uh, another five guys around about the same age group, we used to tour with um, Gary Dixon. So we were kind of like what we would call a meet and greet group. So we didn't go on stage, but we would be there in costume and get involved in all the events and, and one thing or another, um, which is great fun. 
wasn't very exciting at the time, but of course since then, uh, Gary Glitter has um, come out as um, a rather sinister character here. Yeah, I I kind of saw some of that stuff, um, which I think is, is, is a shame, and it almost uh, detracts from the other things that they've done. Do you know what I mean? It, it does, yes, it does. Because we, you know, we really enjoyed his music, we enjoyed his company. We were aware at the time that everybody, or oh, well, I say everybody, a lot of people in the business were um, doing the sort of thing that they shouldn't have been doing at the time, but... Um, it didn't really affect us. It wasn't a problem for us. In no. A, um, it's, it's a thing, and it's, all, it, it's a sadness in a way. A lot of people would like to disassociate, but it's, it puts me in a difficult situation because one part of me says, you know, as a human being, you, you think to yourself, well, I want nothing to do with this and, and no, you know, uh, no association with it at all. No. Uh, but then the other side of it says, well, you know, you can't, I can't walk away from it. It's already out there. People right. You know. Absolutely. Um, and the best you can do is say, well, you know, at the time, it, it, there was nothing, you know, going on at the time. But I had actually, <laughs> I have actually written a, a television film script about our time. Cool. With him. So I'm just trying to get it placed at the moment. So we'll see what happens. So I think at the moment there's, there's been a, another uprising of, of all those stories. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was a big fan of fan of the Glitter Band, and we we have a mutual friend who was involved uh, in the Glitter Band, uh, John Springate. And he was, uh, you know, he was. Uh, I don't know if he. Was, I think he was in the Glitter Band, wasn't he? He was. Yeah, he was yeah. one of the main writers as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, the lead singer as well. So, but um, yeah, old John, he um, is, is probably more difficult for somebody like him than it has been for me. Really. Absolutely. Um, on the front line, as it were. Oh, wonderful. Um, thing, so. And the unfortunate thing is any association you, you have, even be it minimal, it, I, I don't think it's always helpful, really, do you? No, not at all. So well, I, don't, I mean, I don't deny it, because... I'm proud of what I did. At the Absolutely, and and as I said, yeah, and that's the way that's the way that I see it. It's I'm sad it detracts I, from the work, doesn't it? Unfortunately, yeah, if you're if you're in a fixed workplace like an office, for example, and you work with the same people for twenty, thirty years, um, then I, I think that you know things like that um, may be uh, are less likely to happen. But if you're working in our industry where you're always working with different people somewhere down the line there's going to be one person that does something or another person that does something and of course the other side is the other but within the nature of our industry is that those things tend to become extraordinarily public absolutely so, absolutely you know you can't continue worrying about it or being upset about it i mean i watch it because you know i knew him quite well but i see it on television and I, i'm interested in knowing what's going on but um, I'll be honest with you, I kind of don't have an opinion either way. I think he's, he's guilty of things. I, I, I don't, I'm not convinced he's guilty of as many things as he's been accused of. But he's, he's clearly guilty of things. And, and I have to trust the legal system to make the correct judgments on, on things like that. Absolutely. It's kind of upsetting because I remember how nice it was at the time. But then the other side of the coin is, you know, that everybody should be... Um, should be responsible for, for their actions as as we and as we all should be. So let's really go back. Know, let's go back a little bit uh, to the book. Now, can we get an exclusive from you today? Can you confirm or deny that there's going to be a movie made of the book, or are you not allowed to talk about that? Or well, we've been we've been in talks about the movie. Right. Um, we haven't completed the process to the extent that I can say. Yes, there is going to be a movie, but I, I think it's it's likely to happen. Right. Um, everything is everything is working to schedule. Everything is happening the way that it should. All of the underlying rights, which anyone that's been involved in movies or television will, will understand, relates to who owns what. Right. Who has the right to be able to allow something to be made into a movie? All of that is now established. Um, so really, the only thing that we have to do now is have a look through the movie contract and decide that we're happy with it all. And it would appear that that's going to happen. So wow. we can't confirm and say, yes, it's this and we're doing it then and that's the release date. But we've talked, to, uh, we've had a great deal of conversation about how it's going to be made, where it's going to be made, about casting. So I, I feel pretty confident that something's going to happen, but I can't confirm it definitely yet because I don't know. 
So is there any truth in the rumor that they're considering Xander Gibb for the lead role? I think I think most definitely <laughs> it should be considered. I, I think I think I would be <laughs> ideal for the lead role, especially to pay to play a drag queen. I mean, you know, there's typecasting for you. Well, there, there is a side of it. I mean, that they they've um, in regard of the movie. Aside from being, I mean, it wouldn't be me that wrote the screenplay because obviously in the movie industry, really the, the investment has absolutely shoulders and the director that wants to select someone that they know and they trust to write a screenplay but I'm kind of pleased about that because in order to write a screenplay it would have to, the story needs to be condensed considerably and I'm not sure that I want that job no. but one no, of the I... things that they have asked me to do is to come with, if I would consider coming on as a producer Brilliant. For, 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 um, for a couple of reasons really the main reason being that they want to retain the character of the book to, yeah, the, to protect your vision as it were yeah exactly the vision stays the same but the other reason is as an advisor in relation to the drag aspect, right? Um, and uh, and I, you know, there is a there is a part of me that, that looks at it and says, well, really, it's you know, it's a lovely idea to think, oh, you know, an actor can can play the drag part. I mean, we all know, for example, that John Travolta played um, the the character created right. by Divine in the musical version of Hairspray the movie. So though he wasn't playing a drag queen, he was playing a, a female right. in respect. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. You know, but then with the same token, the other side of it is, well, you know, really, should this part be played by drag queens? Well, I, it's funny like because... the I, tradition, you know, the tradition yeah. of, of the, the part um, in Hairspray that was played and created by Divine, traditionally, although it's, it's a female role, is traditionally played by a male in whatever format that they do it, whether it's on stage or it's in film or, you know, it's always played by a male. Token, there's another aspect that sort of says, you know, well, perhaps drag queens should, we should be, yeah, because special drag queens to play the part. So I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose in the long run it probably just won't be my decision. No, but I'm, I'm, I've certainly mentioned it and I've talked about it. And suggested but there are always these arguments about whether gay people should play gay roles, and they say, oh well, if you're an actor, you can play any role. But you know, as as an actor, I I very very rarely get offered to play straight roles and and if if the argument works with that then surely it works for me too that as a as a as a gay person who happens to be an actor why can't i do straight roles and gay roles it's true it's absolutely true i mean I, i'm exactly the same most of the roles that i've played including <laughs> including television have all been uh, in drag you know people employ, employ me as a drag queen essentially i think my, i think of myself as an actor in costume right really but token that you still you know it's, it's a kind of it's a type of typecasting i suppose it is I mean, it is last, i did the last i did a, a film last year called ephemeral nature which was a short film and it was a fashion sort of uh, based film um and i i first received the script and i read through it and um i thought well the first thing i thought was oh this is great there's, there's no lines to learn because it wasn't really much talking to it no it's fabulous you know i can but then i said it, it is a straight man in married and then a couple and I thought, oh you know finally and then of course you get to the last three pages and of course i ended up in drag so <laughs> uh, <laughs> i'm surprised there the last two it's, roles i've played uh, i've played a, a murderous drag queen i mean i really would like someone to say hey come play a family man or something like yeah, that just true. something different you know but i do i do think though if you think about the movie industry uh, as a whole uh, i mean television might be so different but think about movies for the moment generally speaking the definition of a star uh, in, in the true sort of hollywood sense of the star you know like when, when they used to have the, the studio system and such really if you think about those stars as a rule they generally played themselves right yeah, absolutely. That's what people wanted to see. Absolutely. Now, nowadays, you have where it's, it's, you don't have the studio system, so actors are independent and they can take any film or work from the studio that they want to. Um, it's slightly different, and you get people maybe going into character roles. But if you think really about, say, think of like Barbara Streisand, for example, who gets a little mention in the book, by the way, I'll just say, um, think about a like Barbara Streisand. Really, she plays herself. Right. What you see she does. She does. What you get, you get 
Barbara Streisand, whatever role she's playing, whatever character or whatever the circumstances of this character are in, it's still Barbara Streisand. But I think... If you went to see a movie with Barbara Streisand and right. she didn't do that, would you, would you really be happy? No, so, no, but it's like... Um, you you know me personally. You you know me. Yes. You know yes. the real Xander Gibb. But it's totally different from the public persona of Xander Gibb because people don't want to see this, uh, you know, uh, kind of normalish person. They want the vivacious, outrageous, lively, funny Xander Gibb. They don't want to see the guy that's sitting at home and watching television and you know. I mean, Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury put it very well. Um, he, um, he he said. People want to see you getting out of the limo in the fur coat. Yeah, they don't absolutely. Want to see you off the bus wearing and trainers. But they're not interested. That's not what they want to see. Uh, I think there are a few exceptions. For me personally, I can't speak for everybody. There are a few exceptions. I mean, um, Judy Dench is one of my favourite actresses, um, and she plays. Although you still see Judy Dench, she, she's very good at creating characters. Right. And Right. If I go to see a film with Judy Dench, I go to see it because I'm fascinated by her acting ability. If I go to see a film with Barbara Streisand, I go to see it because I want to spend some time with Barbara Streisand. Yeah. It's kind of different in a way. There was a, the, there was a very famous documentary about Michael Jackson, and I can remember there was a quote um, in it from uh, Catherine Hepburn, who I understand was a friend of his, and she said, what it is about Michael Jackson Absolutely. When I think when I think about the entire cast as a drag queen, I think, well, actually, is it really that bad? Uh, well, known from what people want to see. <laughs> actually, I I think that it's a two-edged sword because. Um, like if like if someone calls me tomorrow and says, "Will you do this movie?" Um, unfortunately, we have to pay, pay a, play a drag queen, but we're going to pay you good money. I I would be very foolish to say no, but but the creative side of you always wants to be doing something different. Like for instance, no, absolutely, let's, yeah, you're you know, right. You're, with your like for people that don't know, in the UK, Jeff has just been uh, doing done a couple of runs on the TV show Big Brother and Celebrity Big Brother as a segment host, um, but. Jeff was asked to do that um, in his drag character. Um, um, basically, you were singing, you were singing um, songs to, for the evictees. Am I right? You can expand a bit on that for us yeah. about your. Yeah, the, the setup. It, uh, this, um, we obviously have Big Brother in the same way as we do in the states, and right. then, um, our spin-off show um, has, has had many different names. But at the moment, it's called Big Brothers. Bits on the side. So essentially speaking, you have the, the house itself, so there'll be the television program about what's happened in the house. And then the spin off show bit on the side is when we talk about all the gossip and what's right. going on and keeping up on... Which I'm sure is right up your not, street. Right yeah, so what I do, my job is to, um, to bring the people evicted from the house and brought into the Big Brother studio to be interviewed and grilled and such. My job is to, to bring them into the studio, as it were, to sing them in. Um, we pick a, a song that relates to what they've been doing. Right. Um, so um, it's a different song every time, different costume every time, because, of course, that's what drag queens do. And, um, and then, of course, they, after my sort of comments, to try and relax them and sort of um, see them into the house and settle them in. And then, of course, they, the grilling starts. So uh, that's kind of my job is to bring them in and relax them and shield them and keep it kind of lighthearted <coughs> and, um, and friendly and happy. Right. So, um, <laughs> so, so I guess it's been an amazing springboard for you to be on the TV a lot more. And are you getting recognized in the street? I mean, I know you do the show in drag, but, you know, people are coming and saying, hey, it's him off the telly. Um, yeah, one, once or twice, um, which isn't too bad. People, gen uh, I mean, uh, in, in England... Uh, Generally speaking, people are very polite and relatively shy about things, so we, I don't really get much grief. Um, I get recognised more in costume, right. particularly as I'm still performing regularly in, in London's West End, so I get recognised a lot more in costume. And I, I've had people run across the street screaming with, with camera phones in my face and such, but I don't mind because, you know, everybody's generally quite nice. I know that on the internet there have been one or two things um, said that haven't been quite as nice. But generally speaking, they tend to be things that relate to the people that are writing them rather than what I'm doing. Right. I mean, you can't handle, you know, the, the elements of homophobia or people that just don't get that basically I'm an actor wearing a costume and 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I just happens to be, uh, I'm just happens to be dressed as a woman tomorrow. I'm I think. Just as a, as I, a teddy bear or, you know. Absolutely. I'm head around that part, though. I think even in the gay community, there's an element of that. I mean, you know, just recently here, people have, have, have started, you know, I was in a move um, in a series of movies called The Killer Tranny, and people uh, were kind of, have, have commented on that, and, you know, oh, you're a drag queen. Yeah, I, I played a drag queen. I'm fundamentally an actor. I've done drag. You know, I'm totally open about that. But I think even in the gay scene, that so there's sometimes um, an element of, kind of inverted uh, discrimination if you like why yeah, should and I think it just I think it stems from from misunderstanding or not, me, not me understanding. Too. but I have actually um, dealt with a lot of those issues I hope in the book as well because right. the, the protagonist um, he's coming into a world that's completely and utterly alien to him that he doesn't understand right. and as a gay person himself it does actually talk about those issues and, and, and explains explains it from a professional point of view right um, telling the difference between you know um, costume and, and absolutely one of the lines one of the lines in, in the book um, uh, is where uh, Michael is trying to get his head around the fact that he's got a he's got a dress as a girl um, and there's some confusion between tranny and drag queen and such right and the the other sort of more um, experienced drag queen he explains to him that you know there's a difference between being a drag queen and being a transgender person. Absolutely. In other words, one of them one of them is professional and the other one is vocational. Right. It's quite a big difference. There's a huge difference between the two. Um, but it does touch on a lot of those issues and, and I hope it explains that aspect and shows both sides. I mean there's a trans there's a transgender character in the book as well. Absolutely. Um, there's professional drag queens within the book. On on lots of different scales, you know, that the you, you a lot of people expect to see drag queens to be very bitchy. Um, a lot of them expect to see drag queens that, that are very sort of quite friendly and nice, um, which is kind of more my character. Right. Television character, as it were, or performance character. Um, so it, it covers the full um, gamma, is that a correct word? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It shows all aspects of it. So hopefully, if people do read the book, it might give them a better understanding of, of where drag queens sit on the scale of sort of one to ten, if you like. And the funny thing is that that you know we, we've talked about this before that that all of these other strings to to our bows you know are are just are just um in order to work your way up that ladder i mean i you, you know I remember when I lived in London, I used to um work at your bar as a singer and i I had a great time you know I loved it and and it was great yeah, and i I worked the cabaret scene fantastic people love you there so thank you. I, I remember. I know, I know. Um, I remember once doing a show in your bar, and you know, I used to talk to people in between songs, you know, just to kind of get my breath and stuff. And I remember saying to this lady, "Was she having a nice time?" And she said, oh, "Yeah, I'm having a great time." And she said, "It's my daughter's birthday." And I said, yeah. "Oh, right. Uh, where is she?" And she said, "She's dead." And I thought, what the fuck do I say now, you know? And I looked at you and I looked at Alf and I just went, oh, I'm moving swiftly on and then just went into the next song. I mean, what, you know, you, you just, in these Happy situations, birthday, up there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you wouldn't think that people would be out celebrating a birthday of someone that had died and then actually tell other people about it. But. You know, I, I think a lot of people think that um, someone's just come and knocked on your door and said, hey, Jeff, come do Big Brother. I mean, we've been plugging away at this for 20-odd years. You know, we, we've we not been doing this oh, for yeah, five yeah, minutes. And that quickly, unfortunately. I, it was an interesting thing, in a way. I, I wasn't sure exactly how the booking came about. But on the last, uh, when we finished the last episode, because what it was here, there was um, the 12-week series uh, of Big Brother, which was kind of the civilian series. So, you know, people from the street that have applied or auditioned to go in. <clears throat> and then from that, the final episode, it went straight into the celebrity right. um, series. So, although it was two series, it kind of run, they run concurrently. Um, and um, and so I, I had to wait really until the very end of the final episode of the celebrity series. And I had a chat with the executive producer. And because um, I wasn't sure how it came about initially, I just, you know, they asked me to do that. I went to a meeting. Wow. Um, and I'd done a program called, uh, a program here called The Sun. 
Fallon. And yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and it was created by Engelmar, the same company, um, and essentially it was it was like a, a hairdressing, like a reality show set within a hairdressing salon. Yeah. So you had the main cast were the people who worked within the salon and the, the stylist. And they kind of interview you, don't you, while they're doing whatever they're doing That's right, yeah. So to it's you. like when you go to the hairdressers and you know you have a chat and, um, and you know, so it's as your husband, love. And characters and interesting people coming in. So I, I can't, I'd already done that for in the mall, and um, I wasn't sure whether that was the reason why they came back. Well, they knew who I was because of that. But what they'd actually done was they'd come down to Molly Rocks, which is the venue that I perform at in uh, Central London uh, a couple of times a week. They'd come there, sort of remembering the salon, but then wondering whether I could expand on the new um, the new way that they wanted to do Big Brothers bit on the side because originally in the UK I, I can't speak for elsewhere but in the UK of course Big Brother started as a social experiment but nowadays right. it's kind of evolved into an wow. independent show yeah it's an international yeah, multi-billion dollar yeah. industry they, now yeah, they, they wanted to make it very camp and very fun and, and look a silly, you know, like a, a sort of very fun sort of, like an adult family show, if really? you like, um, and a sort of after watershed show for, for big kids. Um, and that was one of the reasons why they thought about being a drag queen in. But the thing about the part that I play um, uh, is quite complicated. So I think they were looking for somebody that they thought could actually cope with what they were suggesting. And that was why they came to me. Right. Um, because what happens, essentially, um, we hear, um, uh, for people that don't know the Big Brother format, basically, it's, it's um, uh, several people within a closed environment, within a, a house, if you like, the Big Brother house, uh, and uh, they're completely cut off from the outside world. And then uh, once a week, the people within the house nominate each other as to who they don't like or who they think should be a victim. Absolutely. For whatever reason. So we, we get nominees, several nominees, sometimes four, five, six nominees at the beginning of the week. And then the end of the week, uh, after the public telephone voting, finally somebody is evicted. So of course midweek, which is when I get the call to say, okay, there are five nominees, which I will have already seen on television, and these are the five songs that we've picked for those nominees. And, and each song for each nominee would relate to something that's happened to them within the house. So what they, what they do is they, they give it a comedy element. So you sing a song about something that's happened. Of course, it can be quite funny upon occasion because you're taking the mickey or you're sending them up. Right. So then we have to prepare the songs. Uh, we get into the studio, we prepare them, edit them, get them down to the right length, into the right key for me to sing. And then we, I have to rehearse and learn all of those songs. Then I go into uh, the studio um, several hours before the, the, the live show is aired, because it airs live here, um, and uh, we sound check all of the songs, and then we rehearse each and every song in uh, each segment within the program with the interviews wrapped around it so that everybody knows what everybody's doing. Right. Um, uh, but I don't actually know until sort of 20 minutes before I'm going Who the evictee is. Songs I'm doing, because we don't know who's going right. to right so um, so you've got a lot of songs to learn just to cope with that right and the live television right uh, which is why they came to me so um but it's, it can be sort of quite stressful sometimes um but i think uh, the one thing about you and i with things like that is we're kind of used to performing live yeah so whether you're on television or on stage you just get used to coping with certain I think you're grounded when you've when you've worked the cabaret scene. You're grounded to deal with any uh, anything that comes up, like the woman saying to me that her daughter had died. I mean, you you have to be be ready for any eventuality with live work, don't you? You just never know yeah, but it, what's going to happen. Just for drag queens, that's for anybody that's performing. You know, Absolutely. It, it, I mean, I think to some degree, if you're in question as a drag queen, you've almost got carte blanche really to be able to get away with saying anything. And I think that's a help because if you're not in costume as a drag queen, you, you know, often you've got to be a bit more careful or a bit, a, a bit sort of cleverer about what you, what Absolutely. you say and how you respond to people. With live television, of course, you can't even swear. No. So you've got to see it from a completely different viewpoint. Um, and there have been a few moments because you're, you're not just dealing with an entertainment show, you're dealing with people's lives as well. So a 
occasionally when somebody's evicted from the house, uh, everybody that's evicted comes into our studio as a sort of big uh, bit on the side studio, a bit like a rabbit in the headlights. It's a, it's a big shock to them. Um, and so they sometimes react in very odd ways. And of course, it's up to us to kind of pander to that and get round to it. You know, either they refuse to go on or there's one issue or another or I don't want to be asked this or this is going to be a problem. So right. it can be a bit sort of last minute, um, but, but it's great fun. I mean, an enormous amount of fun. And the crew are fantastic. So we, we have a great time. Really. I think... I think the whole procedure with Big Brother, because um, I audition for Big Brother, when when they even do your audition, you go into yeah. this room and the big lights go on, and it's like you know I can I can talk for hours, but I was like, ah, 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 ah. you know, I was planning to go in there and do this impersonation of Jackie yeah. Stallone, who had been on there before, and it was it was just really hard because these lights went on, and I was like, what the frick do I say now? And and I didn't I didn't get picked. I mean, I you know, someone with my personality would have been ideal for Big Brother, and it could have been an amazing springboard for my career, but it, you know, it, it, it kind of just didn't happen. Um, it's a very it's a very odd a very odd set up it's a very strange I mean the whole obviously it, it, uh, the program itself wouldn't work at all if it wasn't if it didn't push people to those extremities uh, of, of life yeah. um, and personality then it wouldn't work anyway but it is an extraordinary set up um, and it's fascinating to watch I mean I'll be honest with you I, I haven't got into many of the Big Brother series over the years because generally speaking the time of night that it's on tends to be the time when you Right. Working, so you kind of miss it. Nowadays, it's a bit easier because you have all these special technological things like catch-up television, yeah, YouTube and such. But of course, we're from the generation where that didn't exist, so you get in the habit of working the same way. But obviously, I've watched this series, the last two series, intently because I've had to be involved, and in the things that I say on screen aren't scripted. Um, I have to improvise. You know, create it or write it. For right. Myself. And it seems to be a very anthropological look at life, Big Brother. It really is, you know, uh, a crazy experiment to put all these people together with different personalities and just see how they react, who cracks first, who sleeps with who. I mean, I was always surprised that they allowed sex to go on when it's all filmed. I mean, I don't know if they still do that now, but, you know. It's it's, it's such a strange thing. And I'll tell you what I really noticed as well is, 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 which is proof of the, the extremity that it pushes people. Yeah. And you see character and personality traits that people would normally keep quite guarded. Yeah. Um, and I've noticed with most of the people that, I mean, not so much the celebrity series, because I think people that are in the celebrity house are far more used to the way that they present themselves and they hold themselves as public figures. Right. But certainly in the, in the civilian house, where you see people and you think, my God, that's so evil, that's, what a bitch, you know, you look, watch them. But then when they come out of the house, once they get over the initial shock of, of what they've been through, they're completely different people. And I remember seeing Vanessa thing, Feltz on the celebrity I one. Where they, on the day when they're, um, what happens here with, yeah. with um, our program, <laughs> excuse me, is that they'll, when they're addicted, they come out onto the, to the show, and as I said, they're like rabbits in the headlight. Uh, yeah. Um, in headlights, and then when you see them again the following week, when the next person is evicted, the previous evictee is invited back, and of course they've had a week to readjust it to into normal life, and they've spoken to their family and friends again, and they've calmed down a bit, and that's when you tend to see what what they're what they're really like. I think um, without being pushed to those extremities, right? But it's, it's so fascinating to to just see the way people respond, and once or twice I've had people be quite. Wow. 
and the week after they say, oh, I'm so, I can't believe I said that, I'm so sorry. <laughs> wow. I'm really, I'm really not that person, I'm really not like that, you know. And you have to look at it and say, well, you know, think about what's going on here. You know, there's two, two million plus viewers, they know it's live, they, they know that they're about to be grilled, they know that people are, you know, they, they've got an answer to them, answer to, to things that they've done and they've said. They don't know what's been going on, what's been said about them already by people that have already been evicted or by the general public. Um, they've just been um, evicted from the house because they've been voted the least popular person. That must be yeah. very difficult to deal with. All pressures on, on yeah. shoulders when they first come out. And, and, and that's what I found fascinating about doing the spin-off show is basically what's happening is certainly for that first week or, or at least that first episode, the social experiment is continuing even though they've come out of the right. house. They're, they're still dealing with pressures but a whole completely different uh, run of, of, of things on their shoulders that they weren't dealing with when they were in the house. I think it's kind of and like their aim that they want you to be this hamster in a cage. I mean, that's the that's the impression I got. They, they, they said, oh, would you be afraid to do this and would you be afraid to do that and would you walk around in your underwear and all of this. I think it's a yeah. constant, you know, they want you to show your worst side and, and all these things, which, which I mean... As an entertainer, you know, I've I've done most things and probably would do most things, but I think that it's the difference between a a, a professional entertainer and just your average person in the street who's looking for fame. Yes. You know. Absolutely, yes. I think I think the thing about reality television, one of the reasons why it's become so big is because it allows the viewer to explore traits of their own personality and, and people that they know, family and friends, Absolutely. without actually having to get involved. It's a bit like watching a soap opera. The more, the more awful the storyline, the more gripping it is, um, because you, you can see it happening and you don't actually have to go through it yourself. No. Uh, it comes back to what we were talking, we were talking about, the, the movies where, I mean, how many times in movies have they destroyed New York or London? Yeah, absolutely. You, don't really, you obviously don't really want it to happen. No. You want to you want to experience what could possibly happen. Absolutely, it's to take you to that uh, place and see how you respond, basically. Exactly, and that's that's really what it is about reality TV shows, and in, in particular Big Brother, um, where it's just it's a fascinating thing to watch. I mean, one of the guys that we had in the last series of Celebrity Big Brother um, was uh, the situation from Jersey Shore. Right. Yeah. He's, he's well, very well known here. Space, you, you, you know him far better than you do here. Jim Tanning and Laundry. Uh, yeah, many people didn't know who he was when he first went in. Um, and so it was, and of course, he did, when, as the people were coming into the house, the celebrities, the English known celebrities, of course, he didn't really know who they were. Right? No. So in, in a way, he was kind of plunged into it. A very brave thing to do. He was plunged into it um, in, in a bigger way than many of the English celebrities were. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's fascinating to watch because his ideas and his way of thinking was very American and right. it was having just come from Jersey Shores uh, being in Big Brother was a completely different thing altogether and I think it was a, a culture shock for him uh, hats off to him he handled it extraordinarily well he did very very well and he came out of it very well very liked in the UK Good. like him they love him um, uh, but it was funny because in a way he went uh, on the world stage he was probably the most famous person that went in there, certainly to do with uh, recent technology like Twitter and Facebook and sort of, you know, the new social right. media of the last sort of half dozen years. Um, but, but, uh, but in the UK, he was actually the least known for television. Um, and it was very interesting to see how he reacted and how he responded. Um, and he did, he did very well. He'd come out of it, apart from those fabulous ads, he, uh, <laughs> he came out of it looking quite good, you know. So tell me, Jeff, uh, how uh, are you... How are you coping with Twitter and Facebook on all these new fangled social media phenomena? Well, Do you find them easy? I've Do you find been, them difficult? I've never been that technically minded, to be honest with you. I mean, I can type because my mother told me to type when I was young because, you know, it's a bit like the old thing, um, uh, the old adage, if you can play the piano, you'll never be out of work. And it's the same with typing. You know, right, you can get right. Or you can type 60 words a minute. Um, so she taught me when I was quite young. Um, but other than that, the only new technical experience I've had was, was in the recording studio as a, as a songwriter and, and uh, a producer, a record producer, uh, where generally speaking, you have an engineer to do it. You say, oh, I want it to do this, and, and they tend to do it. So it took me a long while to get the hang of it. Um, uh, I mean, 
nowadays the kids, my nephews and nieces, they, they, um, I go to them, I say, well, I can't get my phone to do this. What do I do? And they say, oh, you just go do this, and they do it. It's I know, it's, it's damn reality. embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> and they go, oh, they, did you know? It now. Hey, you've and, switched and, the mic off, or you've done this, or you've done that, or you know you have to switch it on. It's like, rah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's, it's really what damn I annoying. Is, more recently, particularly in the last sort of um, six months or so, I found that I've had to just step back from Twitter and Facebook a little bit because you and I in our industry, to some extent, aside from our managers and our agents, we're responsible for our own career. We don't have right. to true gain for no. or someone else takes care of all the tax or someone else takes Absolutely. care of the ocean and stuff. And you just sit and do your job. And what I found is that it's it's not not i found it to be all encompassing. Not to the extent like an addiction because I I, I don't enjoy sitting fiddling about with Facebook and Twitter. But I found that it takes up so much time um uh, just keeping the, the the things like the website and everything up to date takes such a lot of time. So what I've done more recently is I've just backed down a little bit. And, I, um, I think I, as well it- I've concentrated more on writing and, and the things that, you know, actually creating the product rather than putting right. the product out there. Right. I think, I think it personifies you as well. I mean, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time, but I think people you've known for five minutes on Twitter think they know you and own you, especially fans. And, I, and, and, you know, lots of people will be like, oh, fans, you know, big head or whatever. You know, people that like my work, people that buy my albums, they kind of speak to you on Twitter and Facebook like you're their best friend. You know, I think that's the thing about the. I mean, social media um, has kind of happened at the same time; it's grown at the same rate as reality television. Right. And I think it blurs the edges of of celebrity. I mean, I don't. I don't think of myself as a star. I'm unknown. People know who I am because I've been in the business doing stuff for a long time. I don't even really think of myself as a celebrity. I think of myself as someone that's quite known for what I do. But it definitely blurs the edges between people that work within the profession right. and people that don't. Do you think the um, reason... And there's good points and bad points about right. it as well. Um, it's, it's, I mean, the reaction to, to my work on Big Brother was extraordinary on Twitter. Facebook was very quite reserved and a bit more laid back, to be honest with you. Right, yeah, I can see that. Um, and people use Facebook in a different way. Um, but, Do you think uh, you're like... It res- has, it's, it's fascinating to watch. That's the best I can say about it, really. Do you think your response yeah. to, to stardom and celebrity is a lot to do with the way that you've been grounded in the work. Because, like, we didn't come in and go straight to the top. We've had to work our way to the positions that we've got to and that we're going to. We didn't come in and just get, like, yes, right. A-list. No, you're right. So, I, so, think I think that, to some degree, although, it, you know, you can have years and years of frustration, as it were, in another sort of way, the good side of it, if you like, is, is that it, it, it gives you a very good grounding and foundation because you've got a greater understanding of how the system works right. and how it evolves, I think what it does is it enables you to keep your feet on the ground. You're absolutely right. To, to be the person that you want to be and not be coerced into into things that you wouldn't necessarily want to do or that wouldn't be right for your career. You know, no. selecting the right vehicles, for example, comes from years of experience of knowing what does and doesn't work and how people react and how they behave and how people try to steal from you or want a piece of you or totally. your income. And I, I, So I think in a way it's a healthy aspect. But then the other side of it, of course, is when you look at, uh, you compare it to real life, whereby as you start off uh, as you're a youngster, a teenager in your early 20s, where you might be, um, most people would be fit and healthy and able to, to take on the world, but they don't have the wisdom. And no. By the time you reach an age where you've got the wisdom uh, and the knowledge and the understanding of these things, you, your body can't keep up with you. <laughs> so Tell me about it. Like that in a way, as you go further, you've got to find a fine balance between between the two of, of the wisdom from experience and what you're still capable of you doing do. or what you still... You do I mean, indeed. I, I, when I um, started doing drag, I did a show called The Diva Show, which was an impersonation show. So I would wear um, uh, uh, sh- uh, sensible shoes, um, uh, heels, but sensible sort of dance shoes, um, tights, and, and a 
corset like a waist DA, um, and then I would go on stage in character impersonating somebody very famous in a song, for example, like Dolly Parton or Cher, and then I would take the costume off on stage to a little piece of music over sort of 20 seconds, and then do put another costume on and then become another character, and I would get the audience involved in doing my, my zips up and down for me or doing my wigs and things like that. Um, and it was a good it was a good show. I was proud of it. I won an award for it, which was great. And so people must have liked it. A leaders poll um, award. So people must have liked it, and they responded to it. Certainly, when I was on the stage, the audiences. But now I look at it and I think, well, actually, I I, I like that show. I like the idea of doing that show again. But at my age, sort of, you know, just a couple of months away from fifty, I don't think it would be dignified no. to do. When I was when I was you know, 20 years ago, it looked great and it felt great, but now I don't think it would be the right thing for somebody of my right. age group to do. But isn't it funny that so, someone like Madonna doesn't see it like that, because she's just gone out recently and is doing the same old stuff she was doing before. I have the healthiest respect well, for her, don't get me wrong. Admire, but you've got to admire Donna just, Madonna just for her, for her consistency. If yeah. Else. And she's had some great songs and some great, you know, images and looks. And she's one of those people uh, that's like Michael Jackson that's very influenced by his past, as most of us are. Right. And I think if you look at some, I, I, I'm probably going to get a lot of people hating me for this for saying this, but if you look at someone like Lady Gaga, now Lady Gaga perhaps may be a better musician, she perhaps may be a better um, uh, singer, maybe her voice perhaps would be stronger than Madonna's, but if you see what Lady Gaga is doing, it makes you realise upon reflection quite how talented Madonna is right. at what she does. But then, there are a lot of people that say, she shouldn't be doing that at her age. <laughs> She's right, old, absolutely. She shouldn't, be, she shouldn't be doing lunges uh, in, um, uh, uh, or dips in tights and things anymore, you know, she should yeah. her arms up and... <laughs> I know, right? It, I and the funny... In London, tell me exactly the same thing, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, tell me about your involvement in um, so Salem Kapsakski's movie, Spy Darlings. Did uh, I pronounce his name right? Yes, uh, Salem Kapsakski. Yes, a very special project. This. I, um, it's, uh, Spy Darlings is um, in the making at the moment. Hopefully, we're, we're hoping that it's going to be released will teach you <laughs> that will teach you to say if there's anything else you want just let me know yeah so you know being me me being me said oh yeah, yeah anything you want just let me know so yeah we're number 15 songs so so I said 
okay, let's do it. So, um, so they sent me the script, and um, I, I, I'd only read just sort of Gina's part to, to create the lyric for, because I'm, I've written the lyrics for the songs as well as the, as the music, and, and recorded it as well. Um, they've, um, so they sent me the script, and I, I had a good look through, and I had some very detailed um, instructions from um, from Salem, who's not only the uh, director, but he's also the writer. Right. Um, The guy's genius, actually. I mean, I, I've spoken to him, too. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I, I, I feel he's genius. His ideas, his energy. You know, you just want to kind of feed into that. Absolutely. He has are, are immense. Um, and it's a privilege, absolute privilege to be working with him. And everything that I've asked for in relation to being able to put these songs together and, and, and create this part of the film, absolutely everything that I've, I've needed, he's, he's known exactly what he needs and what's required and what's going to work and what isn't going to work. And he comes from a family of, uh, it's like an uh, older amazing. tradition, isn't it, with, with his family? Absolutely. Sounds brilliant. So, um, so they said to me, "What do you think about this?" Um, here's the uh, a DVD of the film they gave me, which it had uh, in the, it's a German film with English subtitles. Um, and then they came back to me and said to me, uh, "What do you think? Do you, would you be interested?" And I said, "Yes." <laughs> like, yeah, you know, definitely. So hopefully, that's a project for next year once we get these other totally. Things, sort of and I know, um, I know, you and I have talked. Uh, about doing a project with uh, with him too um, in the future, oh, yes. which yes, which is a really a really exciting prospect. Um, yes. But uh, we're kind of doing we're we're moving on time wise. I want to just ask you one more question, and then I want to ask you some quick fire questions before we finish. So, uh -oh. how are the U.S. elections being viewed in the U.K. and how do people over there see the candidates? Um. I can't speak for everybody, but the way that it appears, I think the thing 
about um, uh, President Obama is that he comes over here as being quite a cool dude. Right. I think that what English people recognise because uh, of the way that certainly politics are running in this country at the moment and have been for some time, I think people recognise, sensible people recognise that no one person is going to get everything absolutely right. No. So you've kind of got to go with the best that you have at any given time. Right. And trust that, trust that they're going to do the best job that they can and they're going to be honest and they're going to be real and they're going to, they're going to make a difference. Um, and, I mean, perhaps more so with the American president than with the, the English prime minister. He's certainly more, more on the world stage, I would think. Um, right. Because, obviously, America really takes care of those defences as well as everything else. Um, so I think that people see him as quite a cool dude here. To be honest with you, the other candidate, the impression that's given here is that he's quite blinkered. Certainly in here the too. to equality. Right. It's easy for me to stand here as a gay man and say, yeah, yeah, equality right on, we want to be treated the same as everybody else. The gay thing isn't an issue. It's about world equality. It's about right. the equality of everybody. Absolutely. Within the world. And that includes gay people or the LGBT community. And, and he doesn't come across as somebody that's quite got a finger on the pulse of that. So, um, where, so from my viewpoint, where things like equality, peace, health, happiness right. are the most important things in the world, more so than money and oil and power and control. Absolutely. Somebody has got to be in charge of that, and I would rather it be someone who appears to have a better, uh, a stronger recognition of what equality means. So I personally kind of like the idea of Obama saying it. Right. But I do have to, to back that up by saying I don't follow politics greatly. Right. Um, in England or America, so I'm not an authority in this, but my gut feeling is that probably with regards to equality of everybody, including the LGBT um, population of the world, I tend to feel that Obama perhaps could take us just a bit further forward right. towards Absolutely. an end goal. And, and you know, it's funny, you know, we, we've, we've worked in the LGBT community for a long time. Um, did you know that they're actually calling it LGBTQ now? And they're adding Q on for people that are questioning. And, and I find it, you know, I want everything to be all encompassing. But when they say questioning, well, you're questioning, you're either one of the above, above then or you're not. Do you know what I mean? It kind of turns on yeah, its head. I, I do. I understand what exactly what you're saying. I, I can only assume. I, I've not heard of that before. That, you, that you're, you're telling me it's the first time I heard it. I can only assume it's to try and just push the door open a little bit more. It, I'm sure it is. And I suppose, I suppose for some of us that are entrenched within the community already in one part or another, I suppose we should uh, accept responsibility for helping push the door open and if having a queue on the end helps one person out of the, the millions of, in the population I suppose it's probably worth it but it's the first I've heard of it I've not, I haven't heard that before so I think it's a relatively new thing alright let's have some quick fire questions then before we, we oh. wrap up <laughs> Jeff um, alright David Cameron the UK Prime Minister love him or hate him at the moment yeah um, can I only say love or hate no you can say whatever you like but um, let's have quick I fire I say hate I right. say hate I don't oh. hate him but I, I, I don't love him right <laughs> so it's something in between okay Burger King or McDonald's um, Burger King because I am vegetarian right okay so Mac or number people. seven yeah um, say that again, sorry? Mac or number seven? Um, I think Mac. Gordon Ramsay or Donald Trump? <laughs> Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> <laughs> Boxes, Y fronts, or panties? Um, Y fronts. Actually, my, my partner's very into, very into underwear, so I've got to be quite specific about that. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, coffee, fresh or instant? Gin or vodka? Gin. Anne Summers or Victoria's... Oh, gin. Sorry? Sorry, go 
I'm a Birmingham girl, June. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Summers or Victoria's Secret? Um, Anne Summers is more kitsch. Sylvester Stallone or Channing Tatum? Oh, God. Um, Sylvester Stallone is the older guy and Channing Tatum is quite young and hunky. I think Channing, I think Channing Tatum, I think I'd have to go with that. Okay, I would have to go with him too. <laughs> Avon or Chanel? Uh, oh, Chanel. Private practice or Grey's Anatomy? Um, I would have to say Grey's Anatomy because I don't know private practice very well. Right. I keep getting told off because I keep calling it peak practice, which is something totally different. <laughs> Did you watch peak practice the other night? No, it's bloody private practice. All right. Yeah. Gay Times or GQ magazine? Uh, Gay Times or GQ? Um, I think, uh, I think uh, from experience, I think GQ, actually. Right. Okay. Final question. Labor or conservative? Um... Labor. Brilliant. Okay, well, tell people <laughs> where they can find you, Jeff, on Facebook and Twitter, and tell them your website address. Uh, well, my, my website is um, jeffchristian.com, uh, which is Jeff with a J, and Christian spelled with a K rather than the CH. I'll take the CH off and put a K instead. Um, jeffchristian.com, and everything else kind of goes out from there. So if you want to find me on Twitter or Facebook, you can find all that information on my website. Absolutely. Well, thank uh, you so much. for the sale of the book as well on Amazon and such, so everything runs from there. Brilliant. So check out the book, Where Do You Put Your Willy? Buy it on Amazon and check Jeff out on both Facebook and Twitter. Jeff, thank you very much for your time today. What a brilliant interview. Well, thank you so much. I'm very, very grateful. And uh, I'd like to to give my love to everybody over there in the States and um, and my blessings and uh, God bless everybody um, certainly that are affected by this horrific storm at the moment. Um, I, it's, it, we've been watching it here um, and um, I, I really do hope that everybody's okay and that um, everybody's going to be able to recover from this. Um, so I love and blessings from the UK for everybody that's involved in that as well. Well, thank you very much for that, Jeff. Thank you for the interview. Well, that was my interview with the international girl slash guy of mystery, Jeff Christian. Don't forget to check out the Jake Pentland Show uh, here on Blog Talk Radio, Saturdays, 1 p.m. PSD, 4 p.m. EST. Uh, stay safe out there. I hope the cleanup in New York happens quickly, and I, uh, I hope that everybody um, is going to be okay and get back to normal as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your time, and I love you all. Love it.